Why I don't use auto ISO for metering? In this video, I'm gonna share with you some unexpected discoveries on metering that I had in the last three years, photographing in various conditions in the field with different cameras, and how I just found the best metering mode for challenging situations. My go-to metering mode is not AV, not TV, and not the most popular manual with auto ISO. It's actually full manual, but with a twist. I call it zebra driven metering. It allows me to nail the most challenging lighting condition with ease and extreme precision. By the end of this video, you will be able to decide if this metering mode is for you and also understand their strength and weakness. Hi, I'm Tim Man Lee, currently the judge for Nature Photographer of the Year and also Bird Photographer of the Year. I have used manual and auto ISO for years with digital SLR, such as the Nikon DA50 and Canon 1DX Mark II. I even have a free metering guide where I praise how auto ISO is the best thing ever happened to photography. So for manual with auto ISO, I always set evaluative metering for Sony and Canon models and matrix metering for Nikon model. Meaning the camera takes in consideration the whole scene for brightness estimation. And then I set manual aperture, usually wide open, manual shutter speed, depending on how fast the bird and animal say 1600 of a second, so that my aperture and my shutter speed won't change. And I set auto ISO, so the ISO is the only variable to adjust the overall brightness of the photo. For detailed explanation of manual with auto ISO, I recommend you to check out the excellent YouTube videos by Steve Perry and Simon Denchmont, link below. I also set exposure compensation at plus two third or plus 0.7 as an estimate to begin with and do minor adjustment in different scenarios, but mostly plus 0.7 is fine. But since moving to mirrorless three years ago, I no longer use auto ISO. I have switched to full manual with manual ISO. First, let's get to key principle of metering for digital cameras. It also explains the exposure compensation of plus 0.7. It's really to solve one big challenge of digital camera. A photo typically has some dark area, some bright area, and some in the middle. The dark area is called shadow, bright area called highlight, those in the middle are called midtones. Camera sensors doesn't have the same dynamic range as our human eyes. So if I take a photo with exposure the same as the scene, the shadow area in that photo sometimes would be too dark and we can't really see the details in the photos like with our own eyes. Editing software has come to the rescue. We can go to the shadow slider and slide towards the right so that the details in the shadow area will be shown again. But there is a problem. When we bring out the shadow, we also bring out noise. You can use modern day noise removal tool to remove the noise perfectly, but some smart people find out something very interesting. If you take a photo, brighter than what it looks. And in post-processing, you only darken the highlight, which is the brighter part of the photo, and not change anything in the shadow area, then all the details in the shadow will be shown just like what we did earlier with the shadow slider, but this time without noise but with much better details. The first time I took a photo too bright by accident and lowered the highlights, I was blown away by the quality of the photo. That's the idea behind ETTR, exposed to the right. So you may ask, then wouldn't it be even better if I overexposed the photo even more? It doesn't work that way because the highlights of the photo have a upper limit. If it gets too bright, it will be out of range of what the camera can handle and the whole bright area will be pure white, losing all the details or textures. And for photo contest, it's a no-no. If you have watched my previous video, you know I like to shoot wide open aperture. So for example, if I have a 600 f4 lens, I will set the aperture at f4. Unless there are multiple subjects interacting, then I will use f8 provided I can still get a nice background. If the animal is moving fast, I set shutter speed at 1600 of a second. 
If I set auto ISO with a zero exposure compensation, the photo typically looks a bit darker than the scene. But if we set exposure compensation EV to plus 0.7, meaning to make it 0.7 stop brighter than the scene, then the final photo is bright, but the highlights won't be blown out. With digital SLR, I would take photos with auto ISO plus 0.7, then when I review the photos afterwards, and if there is blown out highlights or if it's too dark, I would just adjust the exposure compensation accordingly. For example, if it's a backlit photo with dark background, I would set it to minus one instead so that the rim light doesn't have blown out highlights, but it's still bright. And I've been using it for years. With the introduction of mirrorless cameras such as Canon R5 and Sony A1, I encountered some good and some bad with auto ISO, which eventually leads me to stop using it completely. Good stuff number one. The electronic viewfinder EVF and LCD Now allows me to see the final brightness of the photo without the need to review it later in the LCD. What you see is what you get. The brightness of the image changes when I change the aperture, shutter speed, and ISO. Good stuff number two. Zebras. Sony camera has zebra display in the EVF and LCD. What it means is if my settings cause blown out highlights, that area of the image will have blinking zebra lines to warn me so I can immediately lower the exposure. This is a game changer. Basically, I can avoid having blown out highlights in real time and it solves the biggest problem ever in metering back in DSLR days. Canon cameras don't have real-time zebra, but you can enable real-time RGB red, green, blue histogram. The idea is very similar. You watch the histogram and make sure there's no clipping on the right-hand side of the histogram, which essentially means blown out highlights. But beware, the brightness histogram is not as accurate as the RGB histogram. Histogram isn't as intuitive as Zebra, but it's still fine. Good stuff number three. Many Canon and Sony mirrorless models have three dials now instead of two. So changing ISO becomes super easy. Before, I had to hold one button to activate the ISO settings and then dial it to change ISO. And whenever I have to lift my index finger from the shutter button, I miss critical shots. Bad thing number one about auto ISO. If I set auto ISO, the ISO value seems to jump around even when I'm pointing at the same thing with the same amount of light. So what changed the setting is probably because of the change of highlight and shadow in the image, but not because of the light. It's likely due to the sensitive EVF and slight movement of holding the camera. So rather, I would use manual ISO to force it so it doesn't jump around. Bad thing number two about auto ISO. For sunrise and sunset, light changes quickly. Auto ISO has its advantage for not making disastrous mistakes of making the images too dark or too bright. You can also use exposure compensation for minor adjustment. One problem I found, maybe it's just me, is that there are two things I look at during a photo shoot. The first part is the artistic side which is the composition, the pose, the eyes, waiting for that moment. The second part is the logical part, the camera settings, the aperture, shutter speed, ISO. When I use manual with auto ISO, because I just fixed the aperture and shutter speed and let the camera does the ISO adjustments, I tend to completely pay attention to only the first part, which is the artistic part. And and that is awesome because I can let my creativity lead me. But these days, I put a lot of effort on low light or dramatic light action photography. Light quantity changes rapidly every minute during those times. If I put all my brain power in only the artistic side, I sometimes lost track on the ISO when it's on auto ISO only to find out later that the ISO has already jumped to ISO 10,000 because of low light. And if I set maximum ISO, that doesn't work because the whole photo will be underexposed. I could have easily adjust the shutter speed to be lower to get the ISO back into the usable range instead of ISO 10,000. I'm talking about usable range for publication and big prints. So for example, if I was at shutter speed 1600 of a second, I could have switched to 800 of a second for wildlife action 
Yes, I will miss some action, but I will likely still have half of the Photoshop, but at ISO 5000 instead of ISO 10,000. The image quality would be a lot better, and sometimes I would even go into 320th of a second or even 60th of a second with the IBIS, the in-body image stabilization and the lens image stabilization, I can still get sharp photos while maintaining low ISO. But if I use auto ISO and lost track of the ISO, giving all the control to the camera, I may be doing 1600 of a second at ISO 10,000 or 20,000 instead of 60th of a second at ISO 3200 and get quite a few shots that is still with good quality. It had happened to me countless times and it's painful. Before I sum up, this video is brought to you by me, my digital workflow called Dynamic Tension Stacking. It has gotten over 500 students. Check it out in the link below. So to sum up, I would go into a gambling mode in that situation to try to still get the ultimate shots while being aware of all my settings. Then to give complete control to the camera. Because when I use the EV adjustments, I would only base it on the brightness of the image and I would completely lose track of the ISO value. If you're good at looking at the ISO number at all time while doing auto ISO, then you don't need to worry about it. But time and again, I find out that no matter how much I focus on that, with the auto ISO, I seem to lose track of it in critical moments. Sony and Canon cameras have three dials on their camera now at least the Canon R5 and the Sony A1. So adjusting ISO is super easy with the thumb. And yes, now I use full manuals, but with the help of Zebra and Histogram. I call this method Zebra Driven ISO or RGB Histogram Driven ISO instead of using Auto ISO. It's a bit more work, but I'm in control of all the settings and I know I nail the exposure every time. So basically, I put my thumb on the ISO dial to do the adjustment, exactly like what the camera would have done automatically with Auto ISO, but with finer adjustments. In DSLR time, I would have to review photos after taking the shots to address ISO. Now, I can update ISO real-time precisely based on Zebra and Histogram. Now, one problem, Nikon Z9. I can't believe it only has two dials. So to change ISO, I can't use my thumb directly. Instead, I have to hold another button and at the same time remove my index finger from the shutter button, which causes me to miss shots. Yes, I can use the dial on my lens, but when I'm carrying big lenses such as the 402.8, it's very difficult to rotate the dial on that lens. Also, Nikon doesn't show zebras in real time and only has brightness histogram instead of RGB histogram. I may be wrong, please let me know in the comments. So I have to live with that when I'm using the Nikon Z9 and switch back to auto ISO, which sucks. But it is what it is. The priority right now for me is to use the Z400 2.8 with the internal teleconverter because it gives me much more flexibility switching between 600 and 400. Otherwise, I would use Sony A1 any day. If you like this video, please check out my video on how to nail sharp photos every time in here. <laughs> Don't forget to subscribe, like, and comment below if you have any questions. See you next time.